Thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I am, first of all should point out that I am a layman, uh, and uh, on my way to, through doing all this stuff, um, I've just been studying the Constitution. We have much written Constitution, as you're about to see. Um, and uh, really what I want to do is to uh, empower people to understand that we do have written Constitution and roughly uh, what it is. So uh, the first thing is that uh, how many times have we been told that we have no written constitution? Um, that's something that if you ever made any inquiries about constitution, um, that's the thing we're always told. Uh, but we do have a constitution that uh, has evolved and been written over many centuries. Uh, and all those who hold any office are contracted to obey it by their oaths of office uh, and, of course, by the rules of the law. So there is a question of oath of office and rule of law. And this is, of course, a, basically an honor system. Um, so the question is, looking at it from a sort of engineering point of view, from a mechanical point of view, has Parliament been accorded absolute power? That's a question one would want to ask oneself. If there's no constitution, then presumably Parliament has no control over it, and it can do entirely as it wishes. Um, if so, there can be no constitutional limitations to control it. Conversely, if there is constitutional limitation, it is plain that it ought to act as, as a firm limitation, uh, and the uh, citizens, of course, should from, be able to utilise that to keep the executive and the uh, governing, uh, governing body uh, in check. And, of course, that means there must be means of obtaining redress and remedy. And that, of course, is a vital point. And ultimately, as was Magna Carta, there's actually a right of resistance, so that if the Constitution is disobeyed, um, that ultimately, when all legal means have failed, um, then there is an entitlement to resist. Well, those who uh, say there's no written Constitution, here's a pretty good document, recognised the world over. This is the Magna Carta. This, there's four copies still in existence. Two are held by the British Library, just uh, down the road from here, uh, almost opposite, I think. And uh, this one is Salisbury Cathedral's copy. Um, and, of course, this was a, a document which uh, King John was forced to sign at the time. Um, it's been confirmed, I believe, uh, some people say 32, some people say 35 times. But one way or another, there have been disputes about points, uh, important points within it throughout our history. Uh, and each time, uh, Magna Carta has prevailed. So it's a very important document. Uh, it's very fundamental. Um, one of the most important uh, reconfirmations of Magna Carta, for those of you who are not really familiar with history, um, in 1688 we had what is known as our Glorious Revolution. And uh, there are two documents depicted here. Uh, the one nearest me is our Declaration of Rights from 1688, and that had a statutory form, uh, the Bill of Rights, which is on the uh, right-hand side there. Uh, and these are very important and very interesting documents. Um, they exist, as you can see, they're current. Um, that's my hand holding the Declaration of Rights on the left. And that's how I came to start this whole uh, quest, uh, really, was that I knew a little bit from my history at school that uh, we had had a settlement, a glorious a settlement at the Glorious Revolution, uh, and that, that we had a Bill of Rights, which was indeed the grandfather of Bills of Rights. It's where the American one came from, as you'll see later, and so on. And so it was obviously a very important document. Um, and I thought that it had come from a Declaration of Rights, and that was about all I knew. And uh, we decided to, well, I decided to investigate this, and so I rang up the House of Lords Records Office and said, Do, does such a document still exist, a Declaration of Rights, and may I come and examine it? Uh, and indeed I did and ended up being allowed, they couldn't give me a transcript of it, uh, which is in itself quite remarkable because of course if this had been anywhere else in the world, this document would have been hugely treasured uh, and on display. Um, and it wasn't even in the, recently the British Library had a freedom exhibition and I don't think the Declaration of Rights was present there, although they had the Bill of Rights. 
um, uh, the other document. Um, but the Declaration of Rights is actually the settlement terms of the Glorious Revolution. Now, why this is important is because at that time, the old divine right of kings, where the king was assuming absolute power uh, in 1688 under the Stuart kings, King James and so on, that was put an end to by this settlement. And this particular document, the Declaration, uh, was uh, the fundamental uh, contract by which the whole thing uh, was settled. So we'll come on to that in a little while. But what you have in Magna Carta, and in essence what happened in 1688, incidentally, can comply or can be seen as complying with the terms of enforcement under Magna Carta for claiming redress and remedy. Um, anyway, what, what is Magna Carta? Well, one thing, it's a presumption for liberty. Uh, it's a limitation of power. It stops the power in, in being enforced by the state. It's very important um, because trial by jury is how judgment is uh, created. So you, it's very difficult, as long as trial by jury exists, for a dictator to get hold because he cannot enforce his rules. So this is a vital safeguard to our liberty as trial by your peers. And that was one of the greatest things of Magna Carta, if not the greatest point of it. And of course, it has a, a, a right of a redress and a, a right of enforcement. Now, all that I'm talking about, um, some of these things have been repealed and they say they're no longer statute law. But everything that we're talking about here um, is still current statute law. Um, and uh, so what we got here is a current copy of the, what remains much of, there are 61 or 62 clauses of Magna Carta and uh, that most of them have been repealed. But what remains, uh, by statute law that is, um, the, there is a, a grey area there but we can get into discussion on that. Um, but for now we'll just talk of what is extant, it's in the statute book, so not only is it in Magna Carta, it's also on the statute book and so there's no question about its uh, right to exist, it's there. Um, and here you can see a copy last printed I think in 1978 um, and what remains of uh, Magna Carta and there is this most important clause uh, and really of course if Parliament wanted to do away with it, it would be repealing its right to exist. And uh, no free man shall be taken or imprisoned or deceased of his freehold. Deceased is to have his freehold taken, to be seized and all this. Uh, to be deceased of his freehold or liberties or free custom or to be outlawed or to be exiled or anywise destroyed. Nor will we uh, not pass upon him, nor but by lawful judgment of his peers or by the law of the land. Uh, we will sell to no man. Uh, we will not deny or defer justice or right. So that's a very, very important point. Of course, a lot of us wouldn't think there's a, uh, much when we talk about sell justice today. Um, you need a bit of money usually to, uh, to manage to get yourself sorted out in the courts, um, as we all know. And it, then importantly, notice the bit about enforcement. It shall not be infringed or broken. It shall be a, uh, had of no force or effect if it is. Coming full circle on, well, right on to 1688, at the settlement of the Glorious Revolution, King James II in 1688 was thrown out by armed force. Um, William of Orange, who had a claim to the throne, he was married to James II's daughter, and she was next in line to the throne. Uh, and they came uh, over, William came over with a smaller army than James. He had about 15,000 men. James's forces numbered about 25,000. And uh, uh, James came to do battle. William landed in Torbay, interestingly, on the 5th of November, uh, 1688. And uh, he then proceeded slowly. Um, he went to Exeter to start with. And James took his forces as far as Salisbury. And uh, there he prevaricated and he became stressed and he got serious nosebleeds. And in, during this period, his chief commander of his army, John Churchill, uh, abandoned him and went over to William, which is what William had been informed would happen. So what William did had the popular support of the country behind it. And indeed, then people rose in the north and they all joined William's uh, troops. And William marched to London, James fled, and William came into power. Now, the way that William came into power is of critical importance because what happened is James uh, fled. William got to London and said, well, look, how do you want to settle affairs? Um, he was worried about this country becoming a Catholic nation at that time. Uh, Louis in France, Louis XIV, had 125,000 men under arms. 
and uh, fortunately he had turned south at this time to go down to Austria and uh, have a battle down there. Um, but uh, so William was able to come from Holland with his small force and uh, he was worried about Holland being overrun which was the only Protestant enclave and of course if you know of the Huguenots, the French Protestants who were being thrown out at that time um, and persecuted and they were coming to England um, and it was, religion was about two power bases in Europe at the time in primarily the, the uh, Catholic and the Protestant religion so we were the outpost for the Protestant cause at that time and William wanted to maintain it um, as, so that he could create a bastion uh, against uh, uh, Louis. And he came over, um, he came into London, and he then thought, well, I don't want to be a usurper of power. That wasn't his intention. He wanted a, a settlement that would last. So what he did is he issued an order that the old Parliament of King Charles II, which had last assembled in 1685, i.e. it wasn't a, a parliament that had so many placemen in it from James II and had been packing his parliament with his lackeys. So he decided that, uh, that he, they would call the old parliament plus the aldermen and many uh, burgesses from around to a big meeting on the 26th of December in uh, 1688. And uh, as I say, James II had fled to France with his wife. So these people met. They decided that there should be an election and so they immediately held an election and they sent people around the country. Uh, there was an election and they f formed a new committee which was known as the Convention Committee. And this was all done by the 22nd of January. Um, it's very interesting, when you go back in these old dates, um, a lot of you may not know, but the, the calendar was a different system. And the year changed with Easter. In uh, 1688, it was actually the year change from 1688 to 9 was on the 25th of March. Um, so it was centered on the religious uh, point of Easter. And the thing here is that a lot of the time people have got confused about dates because what is in fact January 1688, uh, we would think of as January 1689. Um, so it's, uh, I'll talk about it as 1688-9 and then it will clarify that for you. Um, so we come to January, um, this convention met, and they assembled on the 12th of, uh, uh, sorry, on the 22nd of January, and they assembled till the 12th of February. And they decided that James had done principally 13 things in principle that were wrong, and that he'd abused the system and the rule of law, and that there were 13 ways in which they should be put right. And they wrote that up into this important document, the Declaration of Rights and then they engrossed and enrolled it and put it in the Chancery. So in other words, it was, became an official document and it's probably the only document in the Chancery where all the statutes are stored that isn't actually a statute. And what it said was that James had done the things wrong, this is how they should be right, James had fled the country and because he'd fled the country, the throne was thereby vacant and that they would offer William and Mary the crown under the terms of this contract. And uh, so it says on the bottom of the document, we pray you accept the same accordingly. Um, and this painting that is on the picture here is important because that was a ceremony on the 13th of February um, where Lord Halifax is actually uh, with the crown kneeling in front of William and Mary. And you can see the clerk of the House of Lords reading the Declaration of Rights prior to passing over the crown. So the crown was, became a conditional contract so when people talk about a constitutionally limited monarchy, it is this scene that actually started to set that whole bit of limitation in place. So the crown was not all powerful. The most important point about this is that what actually happened in this settlement was that it was a victory for the rule of law. And it wasn't a victory for Parliament, as people like to say Parliament, meaning today really the Commons and just about the Lords. Um, but it was a victory for the rule of law to be king or commoner, the law is above you. That is a principle that is enshrined here. And uh, so the revolution of 1688 was a victory for the supremacy of the law and the separation of powers, i.e. The, 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 the Magna Carta business of uh, having trial by jury and so on. Power limited by a contract between the people and the monarch to reaffirm the superiority of the rule of law. 
It was not a victory for Parliament over the Crown uh, or monarchy, as it is frequently and usually portrayed um, by many politicians. Now, this is a vital point because the priority is the rule of law. And the proof of this is very simple. Um, the Declaration of Rights came into being, the Crown was handed over, and then the Bill of Rights came into being subsequent to that because what they decided was that because they knew that people would query this whole setup at a later time, that once they got an ordinary parliament, they thought, well, we better make a bill, um, becoming an act of parliament, to include the Declaration of Rights. So if you read the Bill of Rights, what you'll find is that in its text, um, it just has a little paragraph at the top, and it tells you what's happened, and it says, by the way, here is the Declaration, and then you find the whole of the Declaration within the Bill of Rights cited in it. Um, so you can read the Declaration within it, and then there's more added to the Bill of Rights. Um, but the point is that in the Stuart Kings claimed absolute power, um, and that was wrong. Power was never absolute. They had usurped it. And the power that the Crown rightly possessed before the Glorious Revolution, it possessed afterwards. And so there was no transfer of power to Parliament. And these words in red of the Bill of Rights make that uh, utterly clear. Um, and it tells you what had happened, and here it is. And to whose princely persons the royal state, crown, and dignity of the said realms, with all honours, styles, titles, regalities, prerogatives, powers, jurisdictions, and authorities to the same belonging and appertaining, and most fully, rightfully, and entirely invested and incorporated, united and annexed. So that's wonderful language, and you can see it doesn't leave much out. Everything that the Crown rightfully had beforehand, it would have thereafter. The other great change came in the form of the coronation oath. They decided that having got a new king and queen, we must have a coronation oath written down in an act of parliament. And here is that document, and it's probably the most significant document in terms of our, uh, well, the, 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 the being of England and, and Great Britain, the forming of Great Britain uh, from this period, um, because the world was really changed by the words on this enactment. And what happened is it says, Archbishop or bishop shall say, will you solemnly promise and swear to govern this people of the kingdom of, this kingdom of England and the dominions thereunto belonging, according to the statutes in Parliament agreed on and the laws and customs of the same. Now those words in red, were not in the old Stuart oath. And so the old Stuart kings had been able to deny that they were bound by the statute law. But now here, very plainly, was an enactment for the oath, which was then subsequently sworn at the coronation, and the statutes in Parliament agreed on were included in the coronation oath. So there was a contract quite plain with the people. And this created a very definitely a constitutionally limited monarchy, bound by the custom, the law, and the statute, and of course the oath. And clearly the prerogative power, therefore, of the crown couldn't be used in any way to be in repugnance with the basic and fundamental laws of the kingdom. The kingdom's, the laws in particular, that controlled the use of the crown. The Bill of Rights is one such law. Uh, royal assent is a prerogative of the crown under constitutional restraint. Well, you're beginning to see that. Uh, and therefore it is a matter of law and custom. And there are these most important words once again. Uh, it's a great privilege to be able to go to the House of Lords Records Office and find these documents. After all, this was written in uh, 1689 because it was actually April that this was, the coronation was uh, I think on the 16th of April, uh, 1689. And uh, to, to be able to find these things and actually look at the original thing is something you know, really quite special. To bring us up to date, uh, here is Elizabeth and her father's uh, coronation oaths. Um, not as grand as uh, some of them. But uh, just so that you know this isn't just me talking, um, one of our great lawyers, uh, 100 years later, Sir William Blackstone, or 75 years later, said this about the coronation oath and the Bill of Rights. And incidentally, Sir William Blackstone, many of you will know, wrote some marvelous books which are very highly regarded as literary works and works on the law. Um, called uh, 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 four constitutional volumes of his book. Um, anyway, he says this, however, in what form uh, it so ever be conceived, this is most indisputably a fundamental and original and express contract. 
So there we have it. The crown is bound by a contract. And to reduce that contract to a plain certainty, so that whatever doubts might be formally raised by weak and scrupulous minds about the existence of such an original contract, they must now entirely cease, especially with regard to every prince uh, who has reigned since the year 1688. So you can see that I'm just showing you things that I have been able to confirm uh, in our law books and elsewhere, and in court judgments and so on. So I thought, well, this is terrific. I think I found a limitation to Parliament's power, because Parliament always says it can do what it likes, it can do anything. So I thought, right, we'd better ask a question. So I got my MP, Howard Flight, uh, who kindly went along with this idea, um, to pose a question uh, of Tony Blair um, back in 2000, and, uh, it was July 2000. And I thought, well, let's ask the Prime Minister whether he could recommend a breach of the coronation oath, because that ought to be a fundamental thing. Let's see if they feel if they can do what they like, they can recommend a breach of the coronation oath. It's a bit difficult to see how uh, Her Majesty could agree to a, a breach of her oath. Um, so I wrote the letter, and uh, Tony Blair couldn't answer it himself, which is really <laughs> hardly surprising now. He got Jan Taylor. The Prime Minister has asked me to arrange for a Minister of the Home Office to reply to you direct. I actually find that quite astonishing. It's a very simple question, and there's no doubt what the answer ought to be. We all know that. But anyway, Jack Straw was then Home Secretary, and he wrote back, I can confirm that the coronation oath is a solemn undertaking by the Sovereign, and is regarded as binding throughout her reign. Binding throughout her reign, strong words. Her Majesty would not be advised to give her assent to a provision which contradicted that oath. Wow, we're getting somewhere. Um, some limitation. So let's just go back and have another look at the, uh, the Coronation Oath Act. And on Acts of Parliament, you have a part which is called the Preamble, obviously, at the beginning. And it's very interesting. Here's the Preamble to the 1688-9 uh, Coronation Oath Act. And it says, whereas by the laws and ancient usage of this realm, the kings and queens thereof have taken solemn oath upon the evangelists at their respective coronations to maintain the statute laws and customs of the said realm and all the people and inhabitants thereof in their spiritual and civil rights and properties. Well, think about that. That's really important because it's telling you why the oath is taken. The oath is taken to maintain the statute laws and customs so that the inhabitants, the subjects, can be kept in their spiritual and civil rights and properties. That's quite a thing. Um, so that is the fundamental purpose of Parliament. It's not to take your goods away from you, your chattels and your possessions. It's to secure your uh, private property and your, your uh, spiritual and civil rights. Very important. And then, uh, further into the coronation ceremony itself, the Queen, uh, having uh, said that she'll agree to the statutes in Parliament or agree to govern according, only according to the statutes in Parliament agreed on, will you to your power cause law and justice in mercy to be executed in all your judgments? King or Queen, I will. So there you have it, all judgments will include law with justice in mercy. The things which I have here before promised I will perform and keep, so help me God. So that is a very solemn business. The Queen is in effect elected at her coronation. Of course, there are no objections in, uh, in recent times. I think you have to go back to, uh, I don't know, times of Alfred or whatever, but in technically it's a, uh, it can be, can be conceived as an election. Um, amazing what you can get on the internet this day and age. Um, a very good friend of mine who actually got me started on this whole thing, a chap called Mike Burke, um, discovered this on eBay for about seven quid. And it's actually a line print, as you can see, of that ceremony in the mansion house, uh, sorry, in the banqueting house, um, of the uh, Declaration of Rights being read to William and Mary. And interesting, this dates from the 1750s. Uh, and notice that the title at the top says, The Clerk of the Court reading the Bill of Rights, which should really be the Declaration, but uh, the Bill of Rights to the Prince of Orange in the banqueting, or Prince and Princess of Orange, to the banqueting house at Whitehall, previous to the offering of the crown. So there is an interesting thing. What we have is we have a set of conditions under which the crown was offered. We then have a contract made with the people by the monarchy swearing a coronation oath. Um, that they would abide by the words of the rule of law. 
Well, these words in the Bill of Rights and the content of it are there to control the authorities of the Crown. And if they control the authorities of the Crown, they control the authorities of our Parliament. That must be the only logical uh, deduction. Uh, the, the House of Commons and the House of Lords uh, decide upon context and content, and they determine bills, and once they have agreed them, they are then offered for royal assent, and it is only at that point that a bill becomes an enactment. So the Crown still retains all the power, technically. That is where the power resides, and it resides there. It's our power under contract to the Queen, and it's about our governance. Um, experience has taught, sorry, 300 years after the event in um, 1988, of course, it was thought, well, we better celebrate the Glorious Revolution, uh, 300 years, and uh, they invited lots of heads of Commonwealth and other people uh, uh, over here, and they had a bit of a shindig, and the Queen made a speech, and you, this, these are some of the words or an extract from it. Experience has taught that the peoples can enjoy the full fruits of liberty, security, and justice only when they are represented in a sovereign legislature whose laws are interpreted by an independent judiciary. The Bill of Rights and the Scottish Claim of Rights, which was their equivalent of it, are still part of the statute law, are the sure foundation on which the whole edifice of parliamentary democracy rests, and it has a great influence abroad, especially in the United States of America and the Commonwealth. So there you have it. You're looking at some basic fundamentals, which we acknowledged, and of course, two pound coins, the Royal Mint printed this um, little set there for the, celebrating the cent, uh, tercentenary with the uh, Bill of Rights on the side of the coins. Um, and they did them in silver. Um, and there's a Scottish claim of rights. Uh, and there's another one. Um, interestingly, again, you would think, wouldn't they on a document like this want to show the Declaration of Rights? But no, if you read the text, it says that this was a victory for Parliament to gain power. Um, it also point, has a document in the corner there with an ink splodge on it. Well, quite amazingly, when they were writing the Declaration of Rights between the 12th of February and uh, or before the 12th of February, um, somebody splodged the ink on a, on a copy, and that sheet or, or skin of vellum still exists. And so that's what's actually in the corner of the, of the, of the documents here. It's actually, a, a, you know, a, 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 a draft sheet for the actual Declaration of Rights. But they don't depict it on this document, which is a shame, and there it is. It's the document nearest me. Um, quite extraordinary. Um, it would be, should be much respected. So that's uh, the fundamentals of this thing. So I've basically discovered that they get a bit shy when you say, well, can you recommend a breach of the coronation oath? So uh, I thought we'd better go to Parliament's very own handbook, which is called Erskine May, and this is, again, a second-hand copy from the 1920s, but it doesn't alter these principles. Um, and uh, it's very interesting because it says that the Act of Settlement affirms that the laws of England are the birthright of the people thereof, uh, and all the kings and queens who shall ascend the throne of this realm ought to administer the government of the same, according to the said laws, and all their officers and ministers ought to serve them respectively, according to the same. So here you're seeing quite clearly there's an Act of Parliament that tells ministers that they've got to abide by the law. The succession of the Crown Act, which was an anti-Jacobite act in 1707, declared it high treason for anyone to maintain and affirm by writing, printing, or preaching uh, that the kings or queens of this realm, by and with the authority of Parliament, are not able to make laws of and statutes of sufficient force and validity to limit and bind the Crown and the dissent limitation inheritance and government thereof. Interesting point, isn't it? Nor was this a modern principle of constitutional law established for the first time by the revolution of 1688. If not admitted in its whole force so far back as the great charter of King John, it has been affirmed by Parliament in very ancient times. So there we have it. That's Parliament's own handbook saying, well, wait a minute, we've got uh, the rule of law here. So the rule of law is not just do as we say, the rule of law is a principle. It is a principle about how we shall be governed. And that, of course, is vital, because if it's a principle about how we shall be governed, it probably sets out how we can get redress and remedy.
The Act of Settlement, again, this was passed in 1701. I won't go into details on it, but um, there it is. That was the original one. Cabinet members or privy councillors, um, they all swear oaths of office. Again, I'll come back to that in a little while. Um, parliamentary Code of Conduct. Uh, well, we're now all knowing that we've got Parliamentary Code of Conduct for our MPs. Public duty, MPs' public duty. By virtue of the oath or affirmation of allegiance taken by all members when they are elected to the House. And remember that to be in the House, they have to swear an oath of allegiance. Well, that allegiance is not really doff cap to, you, to your Majesty quite. It's doff cap to the people and to the power of our Constitution. That's what the Majesty of the Crown is all about. And that's where this really resides. Um, but there's a lot of mileage in saying, oh, it's all doff cap to the royalty and all the rest of it. So, by virtue of the oath or affirmation of allegiance taken by all members when they are elected to the House, members have a duty to be faithful and bear true allegiance to Her Majesty the Queen, her heirs and successors according to law. Members have a duty to uphold the law and to act on all occasions in accordance with the public trust placed in them. Well, quite evidently, the public trust we place in our MT MPs is to abide by the rules of our constitutional law in order that we can be governed for our liberty, because that is the purpose of the Constitution. Um, it took me nearly 10 letters to get out of the Lord Chancellor's office. Um, this, I would agree that we are all subject to the rule of law and that this is a fundamental and an essential principle of democracy. As I tried asking them, I said, well, do you think you, could re you, you say you can do anything you like? Well, could you re repeal the rule of law itself and, and put in place a dictatorship? Because that's the ultimate goal if, uh, you, if you can uh, govern everything. And of course, eventually, eventually, I cornered them into that reply. So what you're learning now is that constitution ought at least to be all-powerful. Parliament is only a component uh, under the constitution. It's a subordinate component of it. It's the law-making body of the constitution. Our constitution does not empower parliament with unlimited or absolute power. Well, clearly the Queen shouldn't uh, breach things that go against the terms of her coronation oath. Uh, and therefore, ministers, if they can't advise its breach, again, you can see how it all contracts down and starts to create limitation. Upholding our constitution is the preeminent public duty of all who hold office. Well, of course, that must be the preeminent uh, duty. And it should obviously, therefore, always be their certain policy. Well, we know that that part has fallen to pieces, and indeed they've done some downright uh, uh, opposing things. Um, the people's liberty is ultimately upheld at the discretion of our juries, and there was a very interesting case on this. Um, perverse verdicts, the ultimate common law proof as to the limitation of statute power. A jury may never be directed to give a guilty verdict. Now, just to show you how far things have gone, there was a chap called Wang who I think in 2002, 2003 was having a pee in a railway station and uh, he had his bag mugged from him and uh, the chap picked the wrong bloke because Mr. Wang um, just sorted himself out and grabbed his phone and chased after the mugger who he saw ducking around the end of the platform somewhere, caught up with him and uh, by that time he'd managed to get the emergency services on the phone and call for the police and the mugger had just unzipped the bag and found a samurai sword in the bag and said, well, you won't be calling the police, will you, because you've got an edge weapon in a public place. And Wang said, well, I'm having none of that. Um, and, of course, the police came, and we know what would happen. Of course, they arrested both of them, and, uh, indeed, Mr. Wang got taken to court. And the judge, this is the absolutely incredible bit of this case, the judge said, oh, yes, that's a regulatory thing, you're guilty, you know, and told the jury that... He was guilty. So that was the direction. And of course it was appealed and it was appealed into the House of Lords and there was a unanimous verdict uh, in which Bingham gave judgment and the Lords, uh, bless them, said we can consider that there are no circumstances in which a judge may direct a jury as to somebody's guilt. Now this is terribly important because technically Mr. Ponting, if you remember the secrets case in the late 90s when he blew the gaff on uh, Home Office cover-up or whatever about secrecy laws, um, Ponting was uh, taken to trial and undoubtedly he'd broken the Official Secrets Act, but the, the jury gave a not guilty verdict. Now that is the real strength of jury power, 
and it protects you, me, and all of us in this nation from oppressive measures. So the jury is a common law counsel of whether it thinks a measure is oppressive or not. Generally, of course, if a felon is brought before the court and uh, he's done something wrong, a jury will be as shocked uh, as ever. But in uh, Ponting's case, they took the view that what he was doing was entirely within uh, the letter of the law. And it might well be that the person who blew the, the gaff on the MP's expenses, um, I don't suppose they'd even dare take him to court. But if they did, I don't think you'll find a jury in the land that would convict him. Um, although may technically, he may well have uh, breached the law. But this is jury power. We need it. We need to be absolutely glued to it and not allow any prizing of it out of our hands. And to go the other way, um, to see one of the, what happens when uh, autocratic power takes hold, Henry VIII, and this is the earliest document that I've handled as such, um, had an act against poisoning uh, back in f uh, 1531. And he thought that poisoning was a particularly dastardly thing to do. And uh, the Bishop of Rochester's cook, one Richard Rose, had poisoned uh, the staff in the palace uh, and tried to poison the bishop himself and uh, one Alice Trippett is recorded on here as dying uh, and uh, it says, so it's a bit unclear because it talks about 17 being mortally uh, affected. Um, so I don't know whether it kills 17 people or not, but only, it actually only declares poor Alice Trippett as having died. Uh, anyway, that is the power of these bits of paper or parchment. This act was an act against poisoning. And what did it do? Henry VIII wanted to set an example. So poor old Richard Rose, Rich Richard Rose shall therefore be boiled to death. And indeed he was boiled to death, and I'm able to confirm that in some other parliamentary books that I have, which were printed in the 1750s. Uh, Hall mentions another act, that those who poisoned any person should be put into hot water and boiled to death. This act was made, adds he, because one Richard Rose in the Parliament time had poisoned diverse persons in the Bishop of Rochester's palace for which fact he was duly boiled to death in Smithfields. So that makes you think about it a bit, doesn't it? it brings a bit of reality to this. Now then, uh, excessive bail ought not to be required, nor excessive fines imposed, nor cruel and unusual punishments inflicted. That is one of the 13 clauses and the remedy, or rather, for one of the wrongs that James was about. And that is in the Declaration of Rights, and of course, it is therefore in the Bill of Rights that excessive bail ought not to be required, nor excessive fines imposed, nor cruel and unusual punishments inflicted. Well, cruel punishments did go on, and they went on for much longer into Nelson's Navy. I think we had, um, or certainly had floggings uh, much more recently, but keel hauling, uh, which was a particularly nasty punishment, but it was the usual naval punishment for certain crimes. Um, so what this clause did is it had a civilizing influence, and by and large, I think it stopped the hang drawing and quarterings, which were very grotesque business for those who committed treason. Um, if you ask the man in the street, what about constitution? Generally, we get, oh, well, we don't have one, but the Americans have got one. So let's have a look at the American constitution, because didn't they use exactly the same principles as we did? A lot of them, after all, were Englishmen who had got fed up here and uh, got, didn't like paying too much tax, so they went abroad. And uh, yep, they had their Bill of Rights, and here it is. And, the whole thing is built on exactly the same thing. It's principles written down, known and declared beforehand, which is called law, written law, statute law, and oaths of office and honor to bind this whole lot together so that they shall be obeyed. And of course, that there's means of redress and remedy in event that they go astray. And interestingly, not only did the Americans uh, make their Bill of Rights, they actually copied bits of it word for word from our own. And so here you can see um, excessive bail shall not be required, nor excessive fines imposed, nor cruel and unusual punishments inflicted. Um, and there it is as Article the 10th Article. And those words, of course, come directly from our Bill of Rights. So everyone talks about having a Bill of Rights and the American Bill of Rights and all the rest of it. Well, actually, we've got the granddaddy. There he is. And it's a tremendous document and it's very powerful indeed in my view at least. In, of course, Americans expect their law to be obeyed. And of course, what happened, it doesn't actually say, oh, you must obey the law and get on with it. 
they had a court case, a very important court case in 1803 called Marbury versus Madison. And in it, two laws came into conflict. One was constitutional and one was just made by Congress. And Chief Justice Marshall declared that in any such conflict between the Constitution and a law passed by Congress, the Constitution must always take precedence. Well, that's obviously the logic and the natural thinking that you would expect of it, isn't it? But it's never happened. We've never had a Marbury versus Madison in this country. We have never actually, there are court cases that you can read, and probably the most recent one was the fox hunting case, in which there was just about mention that possibly, that possibly the law lords could actually overturn an act of parliament. Well, surely if you've got constitution, uh, you ultimately need redress and remedy. And sure, the act shouldn't get through in the first place, but if they do, then surely we ought to be able to go peaceably to our courts and get them declared void. Um, and that is something that hasn't happened here, but did happen in America, and that is the only reason that the American uh, Constitution uh, is so revered by their people, simply because they have had uh, such a court case. Now, of course, there is a right of petition. We have a right of petition here to the Crown, and the Americans copied that bit too. So, because that's a bit that connects them with their constitution, to petition the government for redress of grievance. Um, and that, of course, uh, comes out of uh, the Magna Carta as well. We come through to 1930s, and uh, a very astute man called Lord Hewitt of Berry was our Lord Chief Justice. And he wrote a book, as a sitting Lord Chief Justice, called The New Despotism. And chapter four, believe it or not, was called Administrative Lawlessness. Well, coming from a Lord Chief Justice, to see something like that didn't go down so well. Uh, anyway, that uh, manifested itself in a committee sitting called the Committee of Ministers' Powers. Um, that had upset the balance of things, and so they thought, well, we better, better see what he's complaining about. And indeed they did, and this report, the Ministers' Powers report, is important um, because it decided um, what were the rightful powers of ministers. Because up to that time, what had been going on is that they'd started, after the, particularly after the First World War, putting clauses into Acts of Parliament saying, you're the minister of a department minister, and therefore you may have uh, transport under your command or whatever it is, uh, agriculture, fisheries, food, whatever, all those things. Um, but you can make the rules and regulations for your department. And the rules, this is an enabling act, giving you authority to make the rules, and you can sit at the tribunal as in the final arbiter of it. And so, of course, this was all, of course, subordinate to the true rule of law. This was creating an administrative system. And uh, Hewitt said, well, actually, what you're doing is licensing lots of despots um, in the form of the ministers themselves and their systems. And there was a very good bit of text in the beginning of this uh, report. It's a very good report, and I'll just read it to you because it's a most remarkable bit of wording. The most distinctive indication of the change of outlook of the government of this country in recent years has been its growing preoccupation, irrespective of party, with the management of the life of the people. A study of the statute book will show how profoundly the conception of the public function of government has altered. Parliament finds itself increasingly engaged in legislation which has for its conscious aim the regulation of the day-to-day -day affairs of the community and now intervenes in matters formerly thought to be entirely outside its scope. This new orientation has its dangers as well as its merits. Between liberty and government, there is an age-long conflict. It is of vital importance that the new policy, and there you have it, ladies and gentlemen, all this was was a change of policy, right? while truly promoting liberty by securing better conditions of life for the people of this country, should not, in its zeal for interference, deprive them of their initiative and independence, which are the nation's most valuable assets. Well, that was a passage from another report by Lord Macmillan, and I think you'll agree that there's a great deal of that that echoes today, and that was back in 1929-1930. Uh, what happened is that the Minister of Power's report came in 1932, and it criticised uh, the way things were going, and said that, look, if ministers are going to run departments, instead of them just making lots of rules and regulations, all these rules and regulations ought to be numbered and properly written down and, to some extent, approved by Parliament, if not in a whole statutory format, 
um, will create something which they did call the statutory instrument. So now when a minister changes the rate of a license to be uh, enhanced because of inflation or something, they will probably issue a statutory instrument which will have a number and you can go back and find that statutory instrument XYZ, one, two, three, four, um, has the authority or purports to give the parliamentary authority to the minister's change of what he's done. And of course, statutory instruments may be challenged because now if, if a minister acts in creating statutory instruments beyond the scope of his office, then uh, he shouldn't do so. Um, so what we all see as the law mainly tends to be these administrative things. But actually, the rule of law is, the, is beyond that. These are the administrative things. And the proof here comes on the actual creation of statutory instruments act in 1946 and it says to repeal the rules publication act which was the only way rules uh, from uh, ordinances and prerogative rules were just published uh, and in order to um, go further than that to create the statutory instruments and to make further provisions as to the instruments by which statutory powers to make orders rules regulations and other subordinate legislation are exercised and so there you have it, ladies and gentlemen, much of what we're talking about is recognised on the front of enactments as being entirely subordinate to the rule of law. Now, when the Queen gives her royal assent to an enactment, um, this is very interesting because, again, she doesn't rush down to sign the acts, as people some think, and, uh, in the Houses of Parliament or the, the, in the House of Lords. Um, she sends her cousins, they call it her cousins, and she does so by commissioning usually five of them um, to grant her royal assent to the acts. And so what happens is that she signs a, signs a letter patent, which this is a picture of, and you can see Her Majesty's signature at the top. And then at the bottom, unfortunately, it's a photocopy, but that would be the Great Seal of England um, on the bottom. It's a big red uh, uh, sealing wax seal, of course, with the royal seal, or the seal of England. And what it says is that you commissioners can pronounce my royal assent when the two houses have agreed the full content of the enactments, um, and the enactments are listed on the schedule. Well, this schedule is rather important because the middle one of the three acts on that schedule happens to be the Re European Communities Act 1972. So that authority, that letter patent which the Queen has signed, gave her permission the royal uh, to her, uh, her, her cousins, in this case Lord Hailsham, um, to pronounce royal assent for the acts on the schedule. So it's that that transferred the power. And this is very interesting. Well, it doesn't transfer the power. The power recognises the bill to become an enactment. And the text of the letter patent tells us the story. as set forth in the schedule here too. But the said acts are not of force or effect in law without our royal assent. Not of force or effect in law without our royal assent. So there you can see quite clearly where power lies. Power doesn't lie with the commons or the lords. The power is the people's power vested under contract in the crown. And here it is. And the crown gives its royal assent to measures which it approves. But clearly it shouldn't approve unconstitutional measures. Well, talking about unconstitutional measures, um, prior to Lisbon Treaty we had a constitution for Europe being offered us. And uh, Article 10, the constitution and law adopted by the union's institution in exercising competencies conferred on it shall have primacy over the law of member states. Well, that's quite interesting, isn't it? How can it have primacy over our law? Um, anyway, that was an article. Of course, this was chucked out. It was revamped as the Lisbon Treaty. And uh, the Lisbon Treaty, of course, has got it in there that the competencies, the areas over which they can... Uh, have jurisdiction, if you look in the small print, you'll find they can define them, they can alter them. And of course the Constitution became the Lisbon Treaty. Now then, I said we'd go back to the oaths of office, and this is very interesting, this is a Privy Councillor's oath of office. You will, to, this is just a segment of it, uh, which was highlighted earlier in black, and I'll read it to you. You will to your uttermost bear faith and allegiance unto the Queen's Majesty, See the point there, unto the Queen's Majesty, i.e. the Majesty of the Crown, the Majesty of the British Constitution, and will assist and defend all jurisdictions, preeminences, and authorities granted to Her Majesty, and annexed to the Crown by Acts of Parliament or otherwise, against all foreign princes, persons, prelates, states, or potentates, 
It's a, it's a medieval oath that has been kept in place and is still the current oath. And uh, I haven't actually looked since about Christmas time, but if you go through to the Privy Council's website and you look for their oath of office, you will find the whole text there. I mean, you have to dig for it a bit, but it's there. So that's the oath. And of course, the potentate is a, a powerful city, state or body. Um, well, how on earth can we have preeminence if suddenly we don't have preeminence? Because that's the consequence of Lisbon. And William Pitt, back in uh, the 1770s, made a, a wonderful speech uh, in the House of Lords as the Prime Ministers of the day were, although he wasn't, well, he was arguably a Prime Minister or not, but he was a, a leading man. Uh, that to say that if the Commons had passed an unjustifiable vote, it was a matter between God and their own consciences and nobody else had anything to do with it, was such a strange assertion as he had ever heard, and involved a doctrine subversive of the Constitution. What if the Commons should pass a vote abolishing this House, abolishing their own House, and surrendering to the Crown all the rights and liberties of the people? Let's think about those words, surrendering to the Crown all the rights and liberties of the people. Very important, meaning that the Crown has taken over all the rights and liberties because it has gained absolute authority over everything. So what if the Commons should pass a vote abolishing this House, abolishing their own House, and surrendering to the Crown all the rights and liberties of the people? Would it only be a matter between God and their own consciences? Would nobody else have anything to do with it? You would have to do with it. I should have to do with it. Every man in the Kingdom would have to do with it. And every man in the Kingdom would have a right to insist upon the repeal of such a treasonable vote and to bring the authors of it to condign punishment. I therefore again call upon the noble Lord to declare his opinion, unless he will lie under the imputation of being conscious to himself of the illegality of the vote, and yet being restrained by some unworthy motive from avowing it to the world. Lord Mansfield replied not. <laughs> so I think you can see that the Constitution gives supremacy uh, to the law, not to Parliament. The coronation oath is definitely a contract by which people, uh, which we must be governed. It secures the supremacy of the law over both Parliament and the Crown. Uh, to pass powers of governance to those who owe no allegiance to the Crown and thus the people is unconstitutional. Two, to, to pass power to the unaccountable, the unelected and the not removable by the electorate of the UK is also unconstitutional. Acceptance of the supremacy of EU law is a subordination of our constitution to a foreign power. One cannot say otherwise. Uh, to accept the supremacy of EU law, the Queen will, of necessity, have to renounce her coronation contract to facilitate the dismantling of our existing constitution or be put in breach of her oath. Now, if you think about the logic of that, how could the Queen accept other preeminences um, over, us, uh, over us? And indeed, a situation arose between the King of the Belgians and his coronation uh, contract and he did indeed abdicate and have a, uh, a, a, new, a new coronation oath over Catholicism and that was fairly recent um, I think it was in the late 90s um, but this is an important point so you can see that principle ought to hold but of course what's happening with us is that all the principles are being swept under the carpet and nobody's seeing them um, but they are certainly there to be found. I hope I'm digging some out for you. Bowles versus Bank of England in 1912, very important case. Um, for those of you who remember your history lessons a little bit, the budget failed uh, in 1910, and uh, Mr. Bowles was obviously a very wealthy man. He had dividends from shares of about £30,000, but the budget went down. And one clause of the Bill of Rights is no taxation without representation i.e. an enactment of Parliament. There cannot be taxation by the Crown directly. There must be an act of Parliament to justify it. So he said, well, your budget's failed. You can't have your dividend. And the taxman said, no, we're taking our dividend. Bad luck. So he went to court and got this judgment. The Bill of Rights still remains unrepealed. No practice or custom, however prolonged or however acquiesced in on the part of the subject, can be relied on by the Crown as justifying any infringement of its provisions strong words, any infringement of its provisions. And then an issue over television licenses. Uh, Mr Congreve, who I believe was a Queen's solicitor, um, very astutely realised when colour televisions were coming in and everybody had black and white televisions, 
that um, they thought that, that they suddenly realised there was a great opportunity to get some more tax. We'll, uh, suddenly, we won't just have a television licence, it'll be a black and white licence and a colour licence. So we'd all held television licences, those that had black and white televisions, as that was the only thing that was around. Suddenly, colour comes on the scene, so the Home Office suddenly announced that the television licence uh, will be turned into a black and white licence at 12 quid, and you'll have to, if you want a colour television, you'll have to pay 18 quid for your new colour television licence. And uh, Congreve went out and bought a, a television licence the day or two before they changed the system. Um, so he had a year to run um, with a television licence. Um, and he, of course, paid his £12, uh, not uh, £18, as was being demanded. Well, the Home Office, well, he uh, it got publicised in the press, and 44,000 other people went and did the same thing. Uh, and good on them. <laughs> and, of course, he went to, went to court and uh, defended the situation because the Home Office sent demands to everybody and said, oh, you've got to give us your extra six pounds. You've got a colour color television, haven't you? And they said, no, you know, our licences last for all but a year now. Um, and, of course, it got to court and Denning said this, there is yet another reason for holding the demand for six pounds to be unlawful. They were made contrary to the Bill of Rights. They were an attempt to levy money for the use of the Crown without the authority of Parliament, and that is quite enough to damn them. Strong stuff. Now, another feature of the Bill of Rights is parliamentary privilege. So that to make sure that MPs can't be sued for nasty things they might say about any of us uh, in the House, um, and rightly so, uh, they are under a system of privilege. And that privilege is recorded in the Bill of Rights. Uh, Marvellous. So you can imagine that when, a question, uh, when this was questioned, um, as an issue, um, the Speaker, back in 93, Madam Speaker, the question of parliamentary privilege had arisen it is now a well-known court case called Pepper versus Hart. Madam Speaker, the Bill of Rights will be required to be fully respected by all those appearing before the courts. So when it's a matter of parliamentary privilege, they want it fully respected. When it's a matter of the subject's liberty, um, it may be a little tougher. This privilege is confirmed in the Declaration of Bill of Rights, and it's what is known as Article 9, but uh, it's not actually known by number in the, in the documents. When Mr Blunkett lost a, an issue of asylum seekers, um, that got in the press, uh, and uh, it was uh, taken up by the Times, and uh, Camilla Cavendish, a reporter here, asked Lord Wolfe about the issues, and. Uh, because the Lords, in effect, were getting close to saying that, uh, that, that the enactment couldn't apply. Uh, Lord Wolfe asked, what would happen if there had been a clash between parliamentary sovereignty, which of course it means that we're above the law and you do what we say, and the rule of law? His sober answer was that the question ought not to be asked. But of course he's right, technically it ought not to be asked, because Parliament ought to abide by all the constraints upon, uh, the constitutional restraints upon it. Um, but he said his sober answer was that the question ought not to be asked, but it must be. That were the words from Camilla Cavendish. Um, going back to Lord Hewitt, amazing how studying some of these legal things um, gets you a an, an tremendous insight into what's going on. But how far more attractive, and this was Hewitt talking about the rules of administrative law um, rules and regulations under subordinate measures being used to undermine the rule of law itself. And his complaint was that what they were doing was setting up administrative tribunals so that, in effect, you couldn't get to the courts. It wouldn't be a matter for the people. You would go before a tribunal and the tribunal would decide the issue. And that's, of course, what's happened. And very often at the top of the tribunal, you've got the Home Office, it's, uh, you know, the minister or whoever in charge. And Hewitt recognised the problem and put it like this, but how far more attractive uh, to the ingenious and adventurous mind to employ the one to defeat the other and to establish a despotism uh, on the ruins of both. It is manifestly easy to point to a superficial contrast between what was done or attempted in the days of our least wise kings and what is being done or attempted today. In those days, the method was to defy Parliament and it failed. In these days, the method is to cajole, to coerce, and to use Parliament, and it is strangely successful. The old despotism, which was defeated, offered Parliament a challenge. The new despotism, which is not yet defeated, gives Parliament an anaesthetic. The strategy is different, 
but the goal is the same. It is to subordinate Parliament, to evade the courts, and to render the will or the caprice of the executive unfettered and supreme. Now that was 1929, so you can see that he got a pretty good handle on what principles and what the change of principles could do to us. Thank you very much. <laughs>